at the end of the day, countries are sovereign. They act in a manner that they feel responds to their interests. It only changes when countries reach a level of maturity whereby they are willing to forego part of their sovereignty to a higher body. This is what happened in the European Union, for example. So this is a level of maturity that unfortunately we have not reached. Welcome to the Africa podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on this series, we have Ambassador Hisham Youssef, who was a career diplomat with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Egypt. From 2014 to 2019, he served as Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian, Cultural and Social Affairs of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and completed his term in July 2019. From 2001 to 2014, he served as a senior official in the Arab League as official spokesman and later the chief of staff to the Secretary Secretary General Ahmed Musa from 2003 to 2011. From 2012 to 2014, he was uh, Ambassador Yusuf was a senior advisor to the Secretary General of the Arab League on issues pertaining to crisis management as well as the reform of the Arab League. I read all that because it's relevant to the conversation we're having today, which is about not only the future of these institutions that I mentioned, but also the future of the region. It is an honor to welcome you to the program. Thank you so much. Uh, from now on, I'll call you Hisham. Welcome so much, Hisham to Afikra. Well, uh, l- let me start by thanking you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you and to discuss all kinds of things regarding our vision and the future of our vision. Absolutely. Um, the pleasure is ours. Um, let me start with kind of a little biographical stuff. When did you become interested in foreign relations, in government, in governance, in politics um, that led you on this career path? It's a long story, but I, I'll, I'll try to give you the short version. Uh, when I graduated sure. uh, from, from high school, I wanted to become an architect, but I didn't get enough grades that would allow me to go to engineering. So I joined uh, the Faculty of Science. Uh, where I studied physics. And then in the middle of my studies, uh, my father challenged me and told me, your sister is an A student. Why do you just get passing marks? I told him, well, she studies all day and all night and I want to play football. And I used to play football eight, nine, ten hours a day. So so he said, well, uh, all those who can't get A's say that. So, So when he challenged me, I started getting A's and then after graduation, as a result of the fact that I graduated with honors, I was appointed uh, in Kai University. Uh, and then after that, I came to the U.S. for a little while to study for my PhD. Okay. I realized that if I study for a PhD in physics in the U.S., I will stay there. And I didn't want to stay in the U.S. So I went back and a few friends of mine were working on a company. They asked me to join them. And it was a computer company. We were ahead of our time. So we lost our money. And then I decided to go to uh, something because I wanted to work in something that has an international dimension. So I saw, I entered into the exam of the foreign ministry and I passed and I enjoyed it very much. And I stayed until then. What do you think you misunderstood uh, about what it meant to be working in the foreign ministry and working as a diplomat? at the time, when you thought you were going into that path, what did you think that path was going to be versus what it was? Well, diplomacy is a very interesting field because you never know what your career path would look like. So when I started, I never thought that I would be joining the Arab League. I never thought that I would be joining uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Uh, But I did. So, and you, because also it, it's a, a job where you move from one place to another. So you can be posted in Africa, you can be posted in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, and so on. And whatever step you take, it affects the rest of your career. Uh, and there yeah. is a lot of chance in, in this uh, arena. So... Uh, if you yeah. go to one post, it can result in a in a, a, a career path that is totally different than if, if you go to another place. And sometimes luck plays a huge role in 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 that. So, so so this is how things evolved. And every single time, 
I had opportunity to do something new. Uh, I, I took the risk. So joining the Arab League was a risk. Going to the OIC was a risk. But I decided to take it. And uh, I have to say I was extremely lucky throughout my career in doing interesting things. Yeah. You know, I'll give a little backstory. So I, I reached out to you because I was curious about you know, what is this institution that I've heard of my entire life? I grew up in the Arab world. I've always heard of the Arab League. Um, and I realized I, don't, I didn't, don't know anything about the history of it. I don't know anything about the uh, inception of it, the, the intended purpose. And I don't really know how it functions now. Um, for the many listeners who I think are like me, who've grown up hearing the, this phrase, Arab League, but have huge gaps of knowledge, how would you describe what you think the intended purpose of this body w was, was designed? Well, first of all, the Arab League is the first regional organization to be established in the whole world. And the purpose of the Arab League is similar to all regional organizations in the world. And the objective is very simple. It's difficult to achieve, but the objective in and of itself is very simple. So the objective is to try to see how you can advance cooperation between the countries that are part of these organizations in a manner that is uh, much deeper than uh, relations between countries that go beyond. So this applies to the European Union, it applies to the African Union, to ASEAN, to the Organization of American States, all of them. And this applies to the Arab League. So the Arab countries at one point in time uh, that when it was established, there were only seven countries that were uh, had the capability of uh, joining uh, an institution of that nature, and they decided to join. So it, they were seven countries. Now they have become 22. Um, and the objective remains the same. The objective is to see how they can advance their interests, how they can advance their cooperation, integration, and so on. Uh, some steps are more successful than others, some institutions more accept, uh, and, uh, uh, successful than others, but, but in relation to the purpose, that is the purpose when it was established and it remains the purpose uh, until today. Um, it, is, it is not as successful as people were hoping it would be, but, but that is the purpose in, in, in response to your question about, about the purpose. Yeah. G give us some of the, the sort of the the simple history, those seven states that came together, when did they come together and did they have an intention of expanding from seven to 22 or seven to however many they thought? When well, did it happen? What's it, the story? It happened in, in 1945, but, uh, and of course they knew that more countries would be joining. Uh, and this is always the case when you start an institution that is based on an idea, then those who are, uh, have a similar uh, inclination uh, join. So this applies to also all kinds of institutions. So the European Union, when they started, uh, they started uh, small and then they uh, added more and more countries and so on. And the Arab League is the same and so on. There are some, some institutions that cannot go beyond a certain geographical area. So the African Union, for example, is uh, only pertaining to uh, African countries. So it is, uh, you know, they will not add countries from outside uh, outside the continent. So so then there are yeah. sometimes ge uh, geographical limitations in relation to uh, these institutions. Uh, but I think, I think history, important as it is, and how much we learn from history is important. But I think uh, maybe discussing the future would be uh, more important, or evaluating sure. even the present and how things are evolving. So yeah, let me ask you a question then. To what degree do you think that organizations like the Arab League impact the daily lives of the citizens of the 22 nations who are member states? Well, that is a very important question. And this is the question that is uh, the criteria for evaluation for the vast majority of people in the world when they evaluate the organizations in which their countries join. Um, 
And in many instances, particularly in, in our region, when they evaluate the Arab League, they evaluate it from the political perspective only. Why? Because it's the most visible. So they say, well, it hasn't been that, that successful yet in resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It hasn't been successful, you know, in the last decade or so in dealing with uh, the conflicts in Syria, the Yemen, Libya, um, and so on. But then, but then yeah, you can, you know, you have to deal also with other kinds of issues. So the Arab League has a network of organizations, institutions, mechanisms, bodies that deal with almost everything in life that you can think of. And for... Can you give an example? It's, it's hard for okay. me to imagine. Like I, like what? Like water well, reports? I, no, or? I'll give you maybe 10, 15 examples. If you wish. Yeah, because, please. Well, it is, it is also very similar to um, some of the specialized agencies in, in the UN as well. So we have yeah. uh, an organization for uh, cultural cooperation, similar to UNESCO in the UN system. Uh, we have an organization for industrial cooperation, agricultural cooperation. Uh, and for the areas where we do not have an organization, we have a council of ministers that uh, oversee uh, the cooperation between the Arab countries in these areas. So we don't have uh, an institution an, an institution similar to the World Health Organization, but we have a Council of Ministers of Health. Uh, we have a Council of Ministers of Environment, of Energy, of you name it. So there is a huge cooperation in all kinds of areas. And uh, the Arab world is much closer to uh, the countries of the Arab world. Are much, the people even are much closer to each other than in many other areas around the world. And one of the advantages that we have that many other institutions do not have is that um, the, the whole Arab world speaks out. So we are one of the very few organizations in the world that does, you know, does not need any uh, translation. Uh, so you go to the European Union. So for example, at one point in time, we had a meeting between uh, all the Arab countries and all the European countries. So there were, uh, uh, you know, an army of uh, interpreters for, for the meeting. Uh, all of them were for the Europeans, and one of them was for us, which is translation into Arabic. But, the, but then there were maybe 15, 16 other languages that were being used, but they were all used by, by the European countries. So, so this is, you know, the, you know, these are the kinds of, yeah. uh, of areas where, where they cooperate. But then I want to go back to, if, to, to the original question about how, how does this yeah. affect um, I, Maybe I'll give you one or two examples about small things that may yeah. be important. At one point in time after the war in Iraq, uh, the Iraqis had a problem regarding their punctures. So before the war in 2003, uh, they had over 25 million punctures. As a result of the war, the vast majority of, of these punctures were destroyed. And uh, those that were left, uh, where uh, many of them were, were also uh, sick because of, uh, you know, they weren't being taken care of and so on. So Iraq went to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO in Rome, and told, told them, we want experts in uh, panties because we want to revive our panties industry because it affects the environment. We were one of the uh, greatest countries in the world uh, exporting uh, uh, Dates and so on, and we want to to to, to go back to them. Uh, so the FAO told them, well, the best experts in the Arab in the in the world for parties are in an organization that is uh, affiliated with the Arab League. Its headquarters is in Sudan, and it's an organization of agricultural development. So the Iraqis came to us and they told us, well, we want so and so, and we we get got them in touch with the organization of Arab. Uh, agricultural development, and they sent a delegation to, to, to help Iraqis fix their... Yeah. Why didn't they, why didn't they come to you guys to begin well, with? But, but, that, but, but you, <laughs> They've never had dates from anywhere else in the Arab world. Well, that, this is also <laughs> they this went is to part of our ineffectiveness as well, that we, you know, that, yeah. that the information was not available to the Iraqis so that they went to the international, uh, an international organization, which is FAO, uh, to, to seek help while help was much closer to home than they thought, and so on. 
yeah. if I give you another example from the GCC, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, in relation to how it affects uh, the lives of people, uh, uh, citizens of the GCC were able to travel between GCC countries with their ID. This was felt by every single citizen in the GCC because they knew that as a result of cooperation yeah. in the context of the GCC, they can just go to the airport with an ID, uh, have a plane ticket, and go anywhere in the GCC, and so on. So, so there are advantages uh, that, 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 you know, people have, but they do not recognize maybe that this is as a result of uh, cooperation between our countries in different uh, mechanisms and institutions. Yeah. So the word cooperation keeps on coming up, right? Um, if you, I know, you, I know it's not a, a matter of studying the past, but if you were to take a look and track degree of co cooperation across the Arab League historically from 1945 until 2023, and then begin to extrapolate forward, when do you think was the peak of cooperation? And are we at the the valley of cooperation today? Well, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, but it's, 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 you know, the way you, you, you frame it makes it feel as if it's linear. Yeah. It's not. It's cyclic. It goes up and down, up and down, depending on the political developments, the situation in different countries and so on. So I, I, I'll give you some examples of when it was at its worst. So it was at, it, at its worst, for example, when uh, Iraq uh, invaded Kuwait. So the whole focus of the region was about how to liberate Kuwait. Okay, so this dominated the whole situation. And then when you have wars, so there, there is focus on wars rather than anything else. So when you have the wars in Gaza, uh, and this, these have been quite frequent, 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2020, 21, 22, and so on. So, uh, uh, you know, the war in Iraq, uh, 2003, the war in Lebanon, 2006, the separation of South of Sudan, and so on. So when these political crises happen, uh, the focus tends to go to uh, addressing these political uh, problems and crises rather than focus on advancing cooperation in all kinds of fields, whether it's uh, trade, because we have a free trade area that has been beneficial. Not enough, because most of the countries of the Arab world are connected to developed countries rather than connected to each other. So, so there is a lot that yeah. can be done in tourism, in uh, you know, uh, healthcare, in, uh, education, cultural cooperation. You know, you name it. You have all kinds of uh, uh, opportunities for advanced cooperation. But uh, sometimes the political situation that does not allow. Uh, this, this, this cooperation to advance. And then also you have the problems and disputes and difficulties and differences between Arab countries. So, for example, at one point you... in time, um, when Egypt had problems with Libya, Gaddafi would used to send the, all, all the Egyptian workers back home. Things of that nature that results in tension. And then you try to see how this can be resolved and so on. This, this is not limited to this example. This happens all over the Arab world in relation to disputes and conflicts between uh, countries, whether they are neighboring countries or not, then then the focus tends to go to these issues rather than focus on how to advance cooperation, all kinds of areas. What is the what is the precedent or the sort of the the bylaws? Maybe the word is bylaws for um, the governance procedures for dealing with figures like Qaddafi or Saddam and stuff like that. How is the the league supposed to advance cooperation with these types of figures when stuff like that happens? Well, historically and looking well, forward, one of the difficulties is, and this is a difficulty that is facing the whole world in relation to conflict and resolving conflict. It's about sovereignty. At the end of the day, countries are sovereign, and they they act in a manner that they feel response to their interests and how to advance their interests. Uh, and this has not changed and is not expected to change. 
uh, it only changes when countries reach a level of maturity whereby they are willing to forego part of their sovereignty to a higher body. And this is rarely happening in our part of the world, but this is what happened in the European Union, for example, that now has yeah. a single currency. So it delegated dealing with the currency to a higher body. Uh, trade is not being dealt with by the countries, but is dealt, uh, trade is dealt with by the European Commission. So there is a body that is responsible for trade between the European Union and the rest of the world, and so on. So this is a level of maturity that unfortunately we have not reached. Uh, I think the countries in the Gulf were trying to reach that faster because they have homogeneity amongst themselves and they are much closer to each other and so on, and they were able to do so. But then also, I'm sure you noticed that when there was a problem between Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt with Qatar, what happened is that the Gulf Cooperation Council became paralyzed as a result of a political problem. So as a result of the political problem, uh, all the progress pertaining to the Gulf Cooperation Council, whether it was in uh, areas of trade, they're working on customs union, they're working on a network for uh, railways between the countries, uh, linking uh, gas pipelines, linking electricity grids, and so on. So all this is um, becomes hampered as a result of political problems at one point in time or another. So, so this is the, the kind of difficulties that these institutions face, and this is how uh, it is hoped that they are overcome through political dialogues, through inter interference by either other countries or the Secretary General of the Arab League to try to see how these relations can be uh, reconciled in order for, for us to go back to, uh, you know, a normal diplomatic relation. Yeah. To work in these types of scenes, I I'm just imagining these types of scenes, do you have to have a sense of humor? Because you said something interesting. You, you had to say that um, these countries have to be mature, right? Yeah. They have to develop a level of maturity. Similarly, the, the figureheads and the politicians also have to have a level of maturity. I'm sure there is like so many scenes and stories that you can remember that, <laughs> that, that look like, um, you know, children on a playground. Well, I, I can't tell you how many stories I have in relation to all kinds of uh, developments uh, in all kinds of areas. And some of them were quite positive and, uh, and uh, beneficial and others were quite saddening and so on. So, so uh, I, I've seen, I've seen many things. Are you at liberty to share any, any of these memorable stories? Yes, of course. Uh, some of them are, some of them are good stories and some of them are okay. uh, difficult ones. So, uh, so, you know, well, let me, let me tell you one of these stories. So yeah, at, in, in a summit that we had in Beirut, uh, we were discussing the Arab peace initiative. And in that summit, uh, we were supposed to have a statement by, uh, uh, President Arafat who was under siege in Memel. And, and arrangements were made for him to stream it live to the summit and so on. And at the moment when this was supposed to take place, uh, high officials in Lebanon were worried that the signal will be intercepted by Israel and that instead of the Palestinian president, we'll find a senior Israeli official. And we were running around to try to see how this can be resolved. And one of the ideas was to resolve it through having this streamed to a place or an area that is isolated and then transmitted from this small room to the summit so that if there is an interception or something, you can just end the, the, this interception or end the communication. And by, while we were doing that, we weren't able to do that. 
And okay. the Palestinians found that there is some hesitation in relation to allowing the president to speak because of this fear. So they decided to leave. So they took off their seats in the middle of the summit and walked up. So the Secretary General at the time, I went to him and I told him the Palestinians are leaving. He said, no, they can't leave. Go and get them back. This is your responsibility. I said, okay. So I ran and the head of the delegation was a friend. So I told him, you can't leave. He said, okay, we're trying to resolve it and so on. So we went to a room beside the hall and started talking about how it can be resolved. And then we asked for a technician to come to explain how this can be resolved and so on. While we were doing that, the TV was on in this small room that we are on in without voice. Okay. And then the president of Palestine came out on TV delivering his tape. On TV, on Al Jazeera. So, so I thought to my, my, my Palestinian friend, the head of the delegation, okay, let's go back. He said, no, the president was not allowed to speak. We're not coming back. I told him, no, you will come back because this summit is about the Arab Peace Initiative and this is your initiative and you have to come back. This is the first thing. And then the second thing, the president now is talking to the whole region. And this is more important than anything else. What, why, what did he want his message? Who did he want his message to reach to? He said he, the, the, to the people or only to the whole. Now it's reaching the whole Arab world and beyond the Arab world. So it will reach the whole world. So, and so them, it will also reach the leaders. And he was convinced. And we went back to the whole. Mm, so, yeah. so this is only one story. I have many stories of, of a different nature uh, in relation to all kinds of things. So, yeah. so yeah. There, are, there are the good things, the difficult things, the bad things, and so on. If you're speaking to like a nephew or a niece uh, who grew up in Cairo, who says, there's no hope in the Arab world. And they say to you, you worked in it. You worked in politics, you worked in policy. You spent a career trying to get people to cooperate and there's no hope. I want to move to Stockholm, to Hong Kong, to Mexico City, to New York, to Berlin, to Paris, to London. What is your response to them? You say, yep, you're right. I, I, I understand you or do you have a different response? Well, that is a tough question. Yeah, because you're absolutely right. It's, it's about hope. So if you can't give young people hope, you can't prevent them from leaving. You can't tell them, no, you have to stay. No, if they feel that there may be other opportunities elsewhere. I can't, I can't ask people to remain where they see no hope. But then, but then we've had our moments of hope and have had our moments of despair. So when the Arab Revolution started in 2011, it was, it was inspiring. And millions of people had huge hopes. And this was the situation in different countries in the Arab world. Not that the revolutions yeah. succeeded, perhaps they didn't. But the interesting thing about this is that despite the fact that the majority failed, it's not all, but only a few years back, and despite the fact that there are countries that see their neighbors failing, people still decided to go to the streets in the second wave of prizings, demonstrations, revolutions, call it whatever it is. But despite all the difficulties facing the first wave of Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Syria, people decided to go to the streets in Algeria, in Sudan, in Lebanon, and in Iran. Despite the fact that people yeah. in Lebanon can see the situation in Syria, and they have a million Syrians, 
And despite the fact that uh, people in uh, Sudan uh, see very clearly what's happening in Libya and people in Algeria also see what's happening in Libya. But people decided to take to the streets. Why? Because, because they felt that they have not, nothing to lose and that they need to have change. Otherwise, um, it, things cannot continue. And if the situation continues to deteriorate, as we are seeing today, large number of countries in the region, well, you cannot exclude the possibility of having additional waves. So should I ask young people to stay until this happens or to pursue something else? They have to pursue. What's yeah, the they have to pursue what they <laughs> feel is in their interests, and if yeah. they succeed, good and well. You know, there were, and I, there are no numbers, but there were huge numbers of people who came back to different countries in the region when revolutions took place because they felt that perhaps things will change. And of course, many of them regretted by now, but the, but then, but then. You know, such is life. So they, I, I'm sure there will be other opportunities and things will change again because, you yeah. know, if, if the situation continues to deteriorate in different, uh, you know, countries and areas and so on, uh, people will, will be fucked and they will say, well, enough is enough. Yeah. You know, if I, I feel like sometimes I look at the, the last hundred years and I feel like in 300 years or 400 years, they'll look back at the last hundred years in the Arab world and say that this is sort of the dark ages, um, that this was this depression, this deep slump, chaos. Um, do you feel the same way? Well, it depends on where, you, where you're where you looking. For example, if you are sitting in uh, Dubai, they may not feel that way. Or if you're looking at this from Doha or from Gadda uh, uh, or Somewhere else, in the Gulf in particular, the Gulf are not necessarily having uh, a, a bad people. They have uh, enough resources and they are uh, doing a lot of effort in all kinds of areas and can be can see uh, in the retrospect a few decades time, I don't know about the several hundred years. Now things are moving very fast and changing very fast. So, so... Yeah. I'm not sure how far we can see in the future in light of the the speed with which the things are are changing. Look at look at what happened yeah. in the world in the last few months as a result of chat GPT. You know, or how how things would evolve with artificial intelligence and so on. And uh, you know, uh, people in the U.S. are now uh, uh, debating how will this affect uh, the coming year, for example. Yeah. Just like they were wondering how um, social media affected the previous elections. And now they're saying, okay, how will artificial intelligence affect the, the coming election? And so on. So things are very fast. Uh, and, and I, you know, uh, it, they can change in a positive way very fast as well. So we have seen progress in countries in Southeast Asia that took, a, a, you know, a few decades. It didn't take that long. So within one lifetime, we look at what happened in China in relation to, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people in China have moved from poverty to become, um, you know, much, much more uh, prosperous, uh, not necessarily by international standards, but also uh, since, since they moved from poverty outside of the, the poverty uh, area, yeah. then, then they are, they, they much much, much, they are much better off uh, today than they were maybe 10, 20, or 30 years and so on. Yeah. What do you think are some of the, now we're thinking future uh, related, what do you think are some of the key factors that are going to shape politics, definitely not for the next hundred years, but for the next maybe two decades or decade um, in the region? Um, issues that are really underlying issues that may be shaping um, the political landscape here? Well, there are not that many. It will depend on you guys, young people. It will be, depend on women. 
uh, it will depend on leadership, whether we have leaders that would be able to uh, advance the interests of the people. It's uh, the people are not asking asking that much, but but it seems that this this was not achievable. So, and whether this uh, region will be successful in moving towards democracy or not. Because in my view, without having a movement towards democracy, the situation will remain this. You have to have checks and balances. You have to have uh, opposition. You have to have uh, to allow, uh, you know, people uh, evaluate the situation and try to rectify things that are not to, uh, going well and so on. So, so this... This will yeah. have to be the order of the day in order for uh, countries of the region to, you know, try to uh, try to catch up with the rest of the world because the rest of the world is running at a very fast pace. Uh, of course, different regions are, are, you know, doing, uh, you know, performances very widely, but there are huge areas that are advancing at a very fast pace. And if you if you yeah. are not able to enter into this race, uh, you will be at the bottom of the barrel. And uh, I I don't think the Arab world should remain in the situation that it is in at this point in time. So you know, like a common retort that you hear in the region, even among people in my generation and younger, are Arabs can't govern themselves. We need dictators. That's what we need in this region. Um, and. That when I was a, when I was a kid, I thought no way anyone in my generation would believe that. But as I've gotten older, I you know I travel a lot, and I hear extremely well-educated people who have spent decades in Western living in Western democracies, who say with a straight face, Arabs need dictators. We cannot have a democracies; they don't work here. What is your response to that type of saying, sentence? Well, it's very easy. It's, it, you, you can only judge by the performance of the dictators. Okay, where, where was Libya better because, because it had a dictator or was any country in the region better because they had a dictator? And did, uh, are they becoming advanced countries? Uh, the answer is no. Okay. Uh, Yes, people want a strong regime to maintain security because uh, stability um, is extremely important for countries in around the world. But it seems that we love stability more than others. Uh, maybe it's a country, which is fine. But then to argue that we need a dictator that uh, is the only one who understands or knows or uh, capable of taking decisions and so on, without resort to, uh, you know, a manner in which things can can improve and that feedback can advance the situation and then you benefit from different views and then have debates and discussions and so on to see how the situation advances, uh, you know, it, it, it will not work. Of course, it is interesting because China is not a democracy and it's advancing. And there are countries in Southeast and, Asia that also and, succeeded without having a democracy. But uh, And now, neither are any of the places that you said are enjoying a good period right now in the region. But then they are enjoying a good period as a result of the fact that they have financial resources that allows them to... Uh, be able to be comforted. So, but but that is not the question. The question is, had there been democracies in different places uh, that are governed, governed in a way that, that cannot be called democratic? Maybe people are satisfied, but it cannot be democratic. Uh, is the potential the same? I think that is the question. Mm -hmm. uh, could they have been in a better place? Could their performance be better? as a result of a more open democratic system in a sense. I would argue yes. Mm. Some may argue no. Well, that's up to them. But my argument would be no. I think, I think it has been proven in different places around the world that uh, 
you know, having uh, mechanisms for accountability and checks and balances uh, is uh, the best way to, uh, to, uh, to advance the interest. Yeah. We talked about some of the key factors for success. I want to talk about some of the major issues that might shape politics. Um, maybe it's water, water scarcity, um, food scarcity. What are some other things that people much smarter than me who are plugged into this are thinking about when they think about how politics might change over the course of uh, geopolitics? I mean, specifically geopolitics may change over the course of the next few years and decades. Well, you mentioned some of them. You know, no, water is crucial. And you see now uh, issues pertaining to the Renaissance, Renaissance Dam in Egypt, how important they are. And uh, this will not go away. Why? Because uh, Egypt is the gift of the Nile, and Egypt relies on the Nile for over 90% of its water usage. And it has 100 and something million people, and, uh, you know, it, it will have to rely on this resource. So water becomes mm -hmm. crucial. And then associated with water is food security. And you have seen also, as a result of the war in Ukraine, well, you know, there were shortages of food all over the developing countries. And the prices became extremely high, and it resulted in an impact on food security. Uh, so, so these issues would remain key issues uh, as long as people would live to define what what the, what these, what food security means for them and how they can be achieved. And this is not limited to to us in the region. No, this has been a debate in different parts of the world at different periods on all kinds of issues. At one point in time, in Japan, they were discussing uh, what is the percentage of rice that they have to produce in order to be secure. And so on. So, so it is a, a global, a global issue. Then there is another issue that is new that will be a huge challenge, particularly in a region that has an, a large number of poor countries, which is climate change. How will climate change affect the situation in the region? Um, on the positive side, there is advanced technology. So desalination now is becoming uh, more affordable than it used to be, and this is important. So, so this would help as well. There are also advances in relation to agricultural production with, uh, with less water and with all kinds of uh, vertical uh, planting and so on. So there are advances that may help. So technology is key. And, and, and we will see how, how these develop. So, so, so there will be all kinds of developments that will affect uh, the future yeah. that were un unforeseen. I'll just give you another one more example that I think is interesting in relation to technological development. We have been worrying about nuclear weapons for decades. Now we are seeing that the most devastating impact is coming from drones. So at one point, from yeah, drones. at one point in time, drones yeah. coming from Yemen uh, stopped fifty percent of Saudi Arabia's exports of oil. We see how drones affected the war on Ukraine, affected the war uh, between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, affected and so on. So it has become an important dimension pertaining to security and uh, stability. So, so these are the kinds of changes that are being uh, D developed at this point in time that may affect how we deal with with all kinds of things. Uh, Russia has all the nuclear weapons in the world, but is is not doing that well in Ukraine. So, so all these changes will have an impact on security in general, whether it's uh, food security, water security, environmental security, stability, uh, you name it. Do you feel like you see a broader, um, one of the things that you didn't mention is um, the, the sort of the dollar and a possible pivot to China and what that might look like in shaping geopolitics 
here and and within the context of cooperation, like you said something really interesting earlier. You said local states have sort of go to their foreign counterparts before they cooperate with their neighbors. Um, and the nature of that cooperation will change if there is if there is a sort of a a shaking of the ground and a broader sort of about face towards China. Do you feel like that may happen? And if so, what sort of impact do you think that might have on the daily lives of citizens across the region? Well, this is an interesting development that uh, is evolving. So now the question of the U.S. competition with China, which I think is a new form of a Cold War, and it's between China and the U.S. and between the U.S. and Russia. So now we are having a new Cold War. The message that is coming from the vast majority of countries in the developing world is keep us out of your fight. And this is interesting for someone like me who has been working on multilateral issues for a very long time. Because they are saying that we want to be an aligned. But we, they are not doing that through a forum that was established 50 years ago or something, uh, which is called the non-aligned war. So they decided to be non-aligned, but not in a collective manner. So they're sending their message to the different parties and saying, keep us out of that, but they don't want to do it collectively which in my mind is a translation of the death of the non-aligned move because when it was needed most to reflect the position that everybody agrees on, they did not use this platform. So this platform, as far as, far as I'm concerned now, is, is dead. Mm -hmm. So how will this affect this, the relations? We will see because in some instances, um, the U.S. Uh, goes to all kinds of countries on specific issues and say, well, no, this is a red line in as far as cooperation with China is concerned because it may affect uh, them taking our technology and so on. So this would be an area of tension because some uh, military deals regarding weapons and so on will not go through except with guarantees given from the country's concern that to ensure the United States that this technology will not reach but And you have seen I'm also in the that. last few years what happened in relation to the 5G and Huawei and so on. And, and uh, the United States were uh, threatening uh, uh, all kinds of countries if they uh, resort to, to this technology, then it will affect their cooperation with the US. So, yeah. so this will be a source of tension. I have no doubt in my mind between the U.S., uh, the West, in, in some aspects, and many developing countries that do not want to be involved and want to see how they can be isolated from uh, this this problem. Will they succeed in that? We will see. It depends on how things evolve in this battle of wills and this what I consider a new call. Yeah. If if you were a betting man, do you think? that it's likely that I have to explain to my grandkids, my unborn grandkids, um, what the Arab League is or what it was? You see, these organizations usually survive. And, and it's up to the leaders to, it's, it's a tool, you know, the Arab League, the GCC, the United Nations, the Security Council, they're all tools. And if they fail, you can't say, well, the Security Council failed. Yes, of course it failed. But it didn't fail because the Security Council is not working. No, it failed because the countries are taking positions that are not allowing the Security Council to succeed. So, so yes, the Arab League can be better. It can improve. It can, and, and so can any organization. The European Union, you see yeah. how people in Europe are criticizing the European Union, and so on. So uh, the African Union, it's doing much better now uh, than it used to be. But, uh, but then 
People will continue to complain and they want better and they are justified in demanding better. Okay. Um, and then it will depend on the leadership and the institution, the leadership of the institution as well. How well are they performing? How well are they convincing member states to advance cooperation in one area or another? And so on. So it will have its ups and downs. But I think it will survive because, as, as I mentioned about, about the language and cooperation, this is a region that has been cooperating for thousands of years. You know, and, you know, it, it, even before the Arab League, even before all these, this happens, you had people going from Morocco to Hajj in Mecca uh, and Medina and so on. Uh, and on their way, if they find Egypt nice to stay in, they used to stay. And people going to Syria and then they like it. They, li they live there and they stayed and so on. So this was the kind of living that we had. We had. And as a result of all kinds of developments and technology and so on, people now are traveling also much more than they used to and in all kinds of ways. Um, they don't, uh, they are not, it's not easy for somebody to move from one country to another as it used to be. They can't stay yes. anymore. <laughs> Although they do, you know. When, 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 when Iraq invaded Kuwait, we had two million Egyptians in Iraq. When I went to Saudi Arabia for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and I asked my Egyptian colleagues about the number of Egyptians, they told me it, it was around 3 million Egyptians in Saudi Arabia at one point in time, or maybe more. Now it's a little reduced and so on. But it goes to show how many um, Arabs from different countries are living in other Arab countries. Uh, Palestinians in, yeah. in the Gulf or in different places. Lebanese, of course, you know, Lebanon is the only country in the world that has Lebanese people outside the country more than the Lebanese living in the country and so on. So I think 12 times uh, as much. Whatever number, but, but it's, it's a phenomenon that, that <laughs> doesn't happen in the, anywhere in the world. But also you have the countries that have very small population and they need, you know, support from and workers from different places around the world. And they too get workers from different places around the world. And, and it depends on uh, the abilities and the education and the performance of people coming from different countries and whether they are capable of achieving the objective, yes or no, and how and so on. So, but I think, yeah. I think you will safely have a discussion of a similar nature with your grandchildren, telling them, you know, <laughs> the Arab League has it, uh, it's, yeah. it's good sides and it's bad, it's bad sides. And at the end of the day, uh, yeah, uh, you know, when you write something for Africa and it's not good, you can't blame your computer. Yeah. And if it's good, the computer will not take the credit. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I want to end with one question I asked you. Um, I told you I wanted to ask you, um, which is what are five books that you would recommend for anyone who wants to learn more about the history and politics of the Arab world? Yeah, yes. You told me that you're going to ask me this question. That's a very difficult question, a question to answer. And, and yeah. I won't answer it, but I'll, I'll tell you something, something else. I think the importance of this question is a reflection of the importance of reading. And I think that this is key issue. In the age that we're living in today, as a result of technology and as a result of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. So this has changed the behavior of people. And I'm, I was, I was, you know, I, I'd be very glad to see more and more people reading books. Uh, and, and because of the fact, the question that you're asking relates to millions of about all kinds of countries in the region, about the situation in the region, the history of the region. Uh, you know, there are millions of books about uh, the Palestinian Israeli conflict, about uh, the history of Egypt, the history of the Gulf, the history of different countries, and so on. So it's very difficult to identify a few books for people to read. And then now it has become very easy because uh, in whatever area that you want to read or are interested in, you just 
go to Google <laughs> and ask Google or uh, ask uh, any search engine about about what what your interests are. But I think the most important aspect is that young people should read more because uh, the span of attention of tweets and 30 second uh, TikTok videos and Instagram videos and so on uh, and the uh, posts that are a few lines uh, here and there in Facebook or otherwise, um, that does not advance knowledge. And advancing knowledge doesn't happen yeah. except with the reading uh, of a specific nature. And this is what I hope uh, young people would recognize sooner rather than later because uh, if they don't, it would be at their expense. And if they do, it can advance their uh, future, their careers in all kinds of ways. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's do the quick Q&A and then we'll wrap up. So on that note, what are you reading or watching these days? Well, unfortunately, I'm a news addict. So I keep watching the news and especially when you have situations that require close follow-up, especially the situation in Sudan, for example, these days, or the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories or in Al-Aqsa Mosque and so on. So following these issues for me is important to try to understand where things are going. About, about many of the things that we were discussing, you know, uh, uh, where, where are these, where is the situation? Libya going, where is the situation in Yemen going? What will happen in Syria after after the step that was taken towards Bashar al-Assad and so on? So will 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 the Syrian leadership move in a more constructive way or not? And so on. So there yeah. is a lot to follow in relation to development uh, in our part of the world, but also beyond. Uh, now we are approaching. Where, where do you? We're approaching. Where, where do you get your news? Uh, I get my news from, from the extremes. So I go to both extremes and listen to what they have to say. So it covers it covers the vast majority of what's in between. So this is what I have been doing. So and I'll give you an example outside the region. So, uh, so when we had the uh, uh, elections in the US, I used to watch CNN and Fox News because CNN was very supportive of what that Fox was supportive of the other and so on. So, so once you see the spectrum and what the spectrum, two ends of the spectrum are saying, then, then you can easily try to, to gather what all, all those in the middle, what, what all those in the middle are saying. It's funny because I feel like um, these days people don't, who cover the Arab world or, or read about the Arab world rather, um, or watch news, they, they get all their uh, information from social media, which is normal. I, I don't judge it. Um, that, as you as you mentioned earlier, is just a tool. But I always wonder what people who are highly informed where they get their information from. Where do they, you know, what do they rely on to become informed? Well, it's it's the same source of information, but as a result of the fact that I've been doing that for the last forty years or so, then I have better even understanding what the intentions are in relation to um, how this is being trained and how this is presented to the listener. Uh, so so it, it, it comes with experience. So, you know, yeah. it's, uh, because different news outlets have their approach to presenting things. Uh, that nobody mm -hmm. is is objective one hundred percent. Nobody. On, they yeah. all have an angle. Uh, so you have to understand where is this angle coming from, and to what extent the news that you are hearing is accurate or not. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Um, well, it would be very interesting to to have followed. Uh, the decision-making process that led to uh, uh, our defeat, the 5th of June, 1967. So anybody who was 
close to this uh, uh, issue. For me, it, it would be important because I think that this was one of the biggest disasters that we had in the region for the last uh, few decades. And we're still paying the price of our defeat in 1967 until today. So, so for me, knowing more about what happened, it more accurate would be something that I would. Do you think people underrate the psychological trauma that uh, that ha has had on the political class and their ability to make good decisions since then? Um, I, I think, I think we can make all kinds of excuses as to why we're making the right decisions. But the world now has changed to an extent that if you want to achieve something with proper planning and with listening, bringing in the right people, uh, you can achieve it. So it is no longer that, as difficult as it used to be. As a result of expertise, mm. technology, and the closeness of the world, uh, and the globalized world, now it has been easy. And this is one of the advantages that uh, the Gulf has benefited from. Uh, whenever they wanted to do so, they would ask, who's the best person in the world that can do that? Bring him in. And then, and then they, they benefit from the experience of these people because they can afford it and they do the best in all kinds of ways. Uh, so so, yeah. so uh, if you can't afford the best, then you get the second best. But then, but then mediocrity has a very high price. When you, when you do things without, without proper planning and, and knowledge, then the price that is being paid in the long run is huge. And my view, you better not do something uh, uh, with mediocrity. Uh, it's better not done then than do it in a, in a way that is unsatisfying. Yeah. What do you think people miss mo most misunderstand about your work? Uh, I think people underestimate how difficult it is to achieve peace. Uh, although it is supposed to be much easier for people to understand because the differences between people are sometimes very difficult to resolve. Even between brothers, family members, and so on, when they fight together, sometimes the fight becomes ugly. So imagine when it's fights between states and peoples, and it has historical baggage and so on. So sometimes people underestimate, well, why aren't you capable of resolving Libya? Well, it's much more difficult than you think, or Syria, or Yemen, or Israel, Palestine, or whatever it is. So this is, I think, sometimes underestimated. Do you think it's so hard to achieve this? And I, I'm, I'm guilty of that, this misunderstanding, but do you think it's so hard to achieve this because there are structural problems that are preventing peace from being sort of natural status quo? Or, or there are pieces hard to achieve anywhere. It's like balancing a basketball on a finger and you just have to have this perfect set of situations and elements to achieve this? Well, uh, young people now can balance a basketball on a finger very easily. So, <laughs> so it's true. So they have become quite good at that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the power of persuasion has its limits. You need to have leverage. And sometimes you don't. So sometimes all what you have, especially when you talk about an organization like the Arab League or the United Nations, it, it only uses its moral power. So it doesn't have an army to go and threaten somebody. If you don't agree, this is what we're going to do. Or we will impose sanctions on you. Well, the Arab League can't impose sanctions on anybody. It's countries that can impose sanctions, but institutions. So when we go and try to resolve the situation in Lebanon or what? We try to resolve all kinds of issues. Uh, and some of them were successful. Uh, so, for example, uh, persuading the Security Council to come up with a resolution to end the war on Gaza. 
in 2008-2009 who were convincing the Security Council to come up with Resolution 1701 to end the war on Lebanon. This was done by the Arab League. So, and it was done without, without real power or leverage, but without, but going and negotiating and trying to see how this can be achieved in trying to get reconciliation in Iraq. So in 2004, 2005, was it easy? Of course not. When we were trying to get reconciliation in Iraq, the three forces in Iraq were against, uh, ruled by the Arab League, the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Kurds. And we had to persuade the three of them that we will act uh, in a manner that is consistent with the interests of Iraq as a whole, and we will not be biased towards any particular group. And it took a year and a half to convince them, and so on. So, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's hard to wrap uh, to wrap your mind around it for somebody sitting where I'm sitting. Uh, so it's it's helpful that you're uh, giving me context. Um, the last question is, outside of your profession, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Well, we have, we have huge success stories in our part of the world under very difficult circumstances. Uh, so, for example, when someone like Ahmed Zouir uh, gets a Nobel Prize, that's inspiring. And he is a person who has come from uh, modest backgrounds, educated Egypt, went to the United States, and was able to uh, get a Nobel Prize. This is huge. And, and you know, should be recognized as such. Uh, for a uh, writer like Nagib Mahfouz also to get uh, a Nobel Prize. This is also inspiring. And all what you need is a uh, pen and a paper, now a computer. And, and you can, you can achieve all kinds of things. Of course, some things are more difficult than others, but, but there are people in our region that came from modest backgrounds and were able to reach heights that uh, are uh, unparalleled. And it goes to show that we have to change our system because Ahmed Zouil could not have achieved the Nobel Prize had he stayed in Egypt. He had to come to the US in order to get a Nobel Prize. So, so this is also an argument for the change that, that needs to take place in many places in our region in order for us uh, to have more and more successes of, the, of that, uh, because this is yeah. what this region needs. It's more young people who are enthusiastic, energetic, are willing to, you know, to achieve these uh, goals and successes. Thanks for sharing your time and your perspective, Hisham, with us. This was a very, very informational and I, I learned a lot. I really appreciate it. If anyone's interested in connecting with you, uh, you're easy to find online. Um, they can look you up. Um, and and thank you so much. This was really, really helpful. Thank you very much for, for this discussion. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I love talking to young people and hearing what they have to say and what questions they have. And I wish you success in, in your efforts. I looked at some of the, the uh, interviews that you had, and I think I think uh, some of them are quite very interesting. So good luck to you and to your team, and hope that we will continue Thank you so to much. Be I have to say that one of the best things that you said is that I still qualify as a young person. That's <laughs> fantastic. This is my favorite part of the <laughs> interview. <laughs> well, compared to me, so. thanks so much. Thank thanks. you very much.